there's not a person in this room that knows what I'm going to tell you right at, at this moment about myself because so many of you raised your hands. Uh, so I lived uh, over 30 years in Corvallis, raised the family, did my life there. And I also did 20 years as a 4-H leader of a large animal club. So I can relate to the earth and to a little bit about what you all are doing as farmers. And you know, I, in some crazy fit of time, I thought I needed a hobby. And I bought, evolved into one acre, five acre, 10 acre, an 80 acre ranch. Oh my God. That was going to be what I was going to do after I retired and I raised cattle for about, I don't know, 15, 17 years. So, and it was tough. You know, well I had a full time job but this was going to be my retirement. Needless to say it wasn't my retirement. I never worked so hard in my life. So I respect what you're, what you're up to. So tonight you need to know that there's a lot of eyes on Jackson County about this upcoming election. And I'm delighted that you're here to get information because you're going to need education to make the proper decision when you get that ballot, finish with it, and get it into the mail. And in order to get the right information, you need some education. In order to get some education, I'd like to think you're at the right place tonight. So. When I'm done, when Elise is done, let's have some really good questions. I'm, I'm yours for the night. I don't care what time we get done. It's up to you. Uh, I'm going to have a preface to my talk again on a topic that I have never talked to the public about because I think it's on your mind and it's called a four-letter word. I'm sorry, it's a four-letter word. And it's spelled C-O-S-T. I'm getting tired of reading about it already getting tired with the half-truths at best in the ads, okay? And I'm talking for myself. I'm not talking for the organization. This is from me at this moment. So what I'm going to do is to ask you, do you know where I'm coming from at the moment? Have you heard about the costs associated with the passage of the GMO bill? Okay. I had the pleasure about two weeks ago making some comments to county commissioners about uh, the county administrators take on the costs. So before I get to my science, let's take no more than a, another few minutes to, to talk about the costs. So my computer rests if it doesn't have any activity for a few minutes, relax, it's coming back, there we are. So tonight I'm going to talk about the costs, the process, and the patents. And then we're going to talk a little bit about crop yields, the resistances, and the consequences of all of this coming together. And please, my job is to inform, not to convince. Thank you, St. Bernadette, French woman that lived during the mid-1800s. Okay, you all should know that there is an ordinance that the county commissioners passed in 2002. It's called County Pest Control Ordinance. It hasn't cost the county much of any money since it's been passed. It's all about uh, keeping your farm in order. And if you have an apple orchard or you have a pear orchard, you try to keep the pests out of it so they don't make it their way down the road to your neighbor's farm. That's what it's all about. And allow me to say it's all about preventing the buildup and spread of injurious plant and tree pests kind of analogous to transmission of pollen from one neighbor to another. And it goes on to say it encourages property owners to implement control measures, control the pollen, and to recoup expenses incurred by Jackson County, if any, in the treatment of these pests or in the removal of dead trees infested, etc. So it's been on the books about 12 years. And I don't know of any costs. In fact, I don't even think there's anything in the budget, the county budget, to take care of that because most farmers don't allow this kind of nonsense to happen. Uh, you also need to know, I want you to know, that there are a couple of counties, perhaps three counties in California, that have already done what is on the ballot here in Jackson County. And they've done, I don't know, eight, ten years ago or so, 
and their agriculture economy has taken off. And there's been no costs to the county to administer the ban on the planting of genetically modified organisms. If 15119 passes using some county figures, the cost could range from zero, that means zero, not up, nothing, to 219000 or $2 million. That pins it right down, doesn't it? Okay, let's look at the $2 million cost. Most of the plots are on quarter acre, third acre, half acre. A couple that I have seen are very small. I haven't seen them all because they're secret. We don't know where all of these plots are. So there could be some that are out there that are a little larger than what I saw and what I heard about. But the county and estimating costs scale everything up to fixing a 20-acre parcel. Not a quarter acre, not a third acre, not a half an acre, not one acre, not five acres, but 20 acres. So that multiplies the cost. And the difference between the 200000 and the $2 million, which is $1.8 million, is due to the removal of topsoil from a 20-acre parcel that may be contaminated with plants, <coughs> genetically engineered plants. This is what the county is proposing? This is what the county is estimating the cost would be. Okay, there is nothing in the bill that says you have to remove topsoil. As and a former EPA scientist, I tell you that the only time topsoil is removed and when is after a horrendous toxic chemical spill or something analogous to that. Not when you have plants that you need to remove. When you want to remove plants, you get someone out there, as the seed companies have, and you pull them out of the ground to move them down the road. You put them in a dump truck, put the lid on the dump truck, and haul them off to a landfill. You don't remove 20 acres of topsoil and spend $1.8 million. I don't know why, where, or how that situation came up, but leave that as it may. Uh, also, I want to go to the next slide and say this. If your current tax bill, for example, is $1,000, and you're paying property taxes $1,000 a year, the money will come uh, using the county number of that $200,000 figure, which is interestingly very close to the salary of the man who wrote the report. Mm -hmm. Coincidence. <laughs> uh, okay, the cost of two hundred thousand on a thirty-two million dollar general fund budget means it's 07 of one percent of the total budget to implement fifteen dash one nineteen, according to the county. But remember, it could be zero, not a, nothing. If you want to use the high figure of two hundred thousand, the estimated cost is seven dollars per taxpayer if your current tax bill is a thousand dollars so if your current tax bill is two thousand dollars the new cost would be fourteen dollars <coughs> etc using the county figures but i told you several times and given you examples of why it's probably not going to be any cost oh and it gets better There's actually no new cost out of your pocket as a taxpayer. No new cost. Zero dollars. If you vote for this and it passes, and the county says it costs $200,000, you won't pay a dollar more in your property tax bill because of this. And the reason for that is the money's got to come out of the general fund, the general fund of the county budget. I am not an expert on county budgets. I called the assessor's office two days ago and had this conversation. It will not cost anything. Nada. Zero. Where's the money going to come from? It comes out of the general fund of existing budgets, of the existing money. So the sheriff may lose $1,000 out of his budget. The county commissioners may lose $590 out of their budget, et cetera. The only way it's going to cost you that $7 on the last slide is when it goes to a levy, you know, like a tax levy for the libraries. Uh, 
tax levy for extension. That's where it's going to cost a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit more money. But for 15119, there is no tax levy. And any expenses from that has got to come out of the existing budget. You like smaller government? You like smaller government? That's what you're going to get with 15-119. Because there's no new money, and the government's going to get smaller because 0.7 of 1% has to be taken out of the existing budget. And it's going to, therefore, be a smaller government, a smaller budget. Do you understand? Are there any questions about that? So it's Please. not seven thousand or seven dollars per thousand dollars of assessed value of the property. It's, Correct. It's what you pay, actually. It's going to be using that example, the highest and reasonable example. In other words, we're not talking the two million dollars, the the the, the uh, disastrous fund cleanup. We're going to use just so we can communicate. We're going to use $200,000. That money. $200,000 Where is from that? What? Um, from the county? That's the, the county administrator's number. Where does that dollar, where does that $200,000 come from? It comes out of the $32 million general fund that's already in place. It's not going to come, you're not going to send $7 more to the county. Not unless it comes up <laughs> sometime in the future on some levy, like the library levy, or mm. like the extension levy. Didn't that bill 12 years ago say the fender had to pay? Uh, that bill 12 years ago uh, was not that specific in the parts that I read, okay. and there's no, been no abatement money spent on that, on that 2002 uh, bill. I have a question. Uh, it, apparently, uh, these measures will, in fact, make it illegal for GMOs to be grown, right? Yes. Why, then, is the cost associated with, with uh, disobeying those laws forced back on the suppliers? It is. Why not say that? Because that's a lot you know. We'll let, we'll let Elise address that at the end, because okay. I'm getting a little bit out of my area of comfort. But, yes, that is basically it. <laughs> Yes. Ray, are you trying to say that if this thing passes, Mr. Jordan or Mr. Winters or some of our other county employees might have to work a little bit harder for the same money that they're getting paid? I doubt it. They'll take the money out somewhere else. It'll come out of the sheriff's fund, probably. Uh, uh, yeah, good question. Okay. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we'll go back. We'll let you do science and all the best. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's get on to this. Oh, <laughs> one other question? Yes, sir. Two, actually. One, let's say hypothetically, you know, this passes, and someone makes a complaint against Farmer Brown, and he is found out that, yes, he has been growing GMOs on his property. But he refuses to pay. How will you get the money back? Uh, again, I'm not an expert on that, and I'll I'll answer answer can, can answer. I'll answer really quickly. So um, the county has discretion on whether to enforce this measure or not. So the county could say, we don't have the money in our budget, and we don't want to do anything. And what happens is at least me, as farmer um, black, can say to farmer brown, you know what, I'm going to take legal action against you. I can't have a frivolous you know, lawsuit against you, I have to prove, actually prove that you're growing genetically engineered crops. So it's not going to just be everybody taking everybody to court willy nilly. And it's pretty easy to prove because to grow a genetically engineered crop, you have to sign a legal document. It's not something you go down to the store. Well, I understand that, but so. I think even if he's found mm -hmm. guilty, mm -hmm. he says, I'm not going to pay it. Mm -hmm. How are you going So you, you as, a, as a farmer, can take legal action. Okay. And what? And who will pay for it if, let's say, Farmer Brown didn't have any GMOs? Who's going to pay for the whole testing and everything else? Where is that the, money? The, the testing is two hundred dollars. Yep. So I think, as a farmer next door, and I'm, I'm, like saving my farm, I'm happy to pay two hundred dollars. So yeah. 
But I think we'll get on to raise and then we'll yes. talk about the measure and actually what it means and then I'll talk about the implementation and enforcement part. Okay. Now that I've eaten up half of my science talk and regretting that I went there for the first time, well, let's get on with it. Okay. So what the heck is exactly a gen genetically modified organism? Let's use this definition. It's, something, it's an organism that we're going to create in the laboratory and we're going to take one or two or three genes from over here, in this case from bacteria, and put them into a plant cell. So we've taken a few genes from a very, very distantly related organism and put it, put it into a corn cell or soybean cell and we've created something that has never been on this planet before. It's unique, it's novel, therefore it's patentable. And here's quickly what I'm talking about. We take some plant tissue and DNA, these little circles are meant to be pieces of DNA from the bacteria. And guess what? They're put in a test tube and dropped in, you drop in some particles of gold literally gold, microscopic particles of gold, which are bullets. The DNA circles adhere to the bullets. Well, Thank you. And those bullets are loaded into a gun, and that gun literally shoots those gold bullets into plant tissue, carrying with it the DNA of the bacteria. Once in a while, the DNA will get at the right place at the right time and produce that different cell. So those cells are then put on a nutritive medium in the sunlight or artificial light and given all kinds of growth stimulants so that they begin to reproduce a plant from one cell. They'll grow back. If it's a soybean plant, you get a soybean plant back. But it's different kind of a soybean plant. And here are some examples. The guys that on the right are green, they're happy, they're healthy, they're growing. The ones on the left have originated from an individual cell that, wow, that did not receive the bullet with the DNA. This plate's been sprayed with Roundup. The little plantlets on the left are dying. The plantlets on the right are real happy and are growing and they're resistant to the Roundup. So that's how you know you're successful. These little plantlets then are put into soil in the laboratory or a greenhouse, and then they're grown out. They go to seed, the seeds are planted again, and again, and everything is scaled up. That's all there is to it. Do the seeds uh, reproduce uh, like after time, or do they? Forever. It's permanently part of the genetic material of whatever it is that you put it into. Does this take a week or years to accomplish this? Uh, right to this stage, or let's back it up just a little bit, maybe uh, you shot it and you put these individual cells on a plate uh, a week, 10 days, and then it would take the normal length of time, depending on the variety of your plant, to grow from a little plantlet that maybe is germinated out to a full plant. So 50, 60, 70 days. Well, I mean, you're going to have tons of seed, or are you just going to have a little bag or a little bus, bucket? You're going to have about, if it's corn, you're going to have about three cobs to work with. Yeah. The very, very first time. And then you take those co cobs to Hawaii, where you can generate three to four crops in one year. And each time, you know, you're scaling up the number of seeds. So it does take the company, uh, they say, a a, a, around 10 years to get, it, to get it out to be field ready on a large scale. And on that previous slide, it said, I think that one, the one before or after, I'm not sure, it said something about RR. Was that Roundup? Ah, Roundup resistant. Sorry, resistant. thanks for catching that. Roundup resistant. And it makes a toxin from another bacteria. We'll just abbreviate it BT toxin. And that toxin from the bacteria is the one that kills the corn root worm, as an example. What's the negative of the GMO soybean? That's the rest of my talk. Okay. <laughs> okay, so one of the big deals at Company of Teddy, that process we've been doing for 10,000, humans have been doing for 10,000 years. 
only it's more precise because it's done in a laboratory. So I offer up, does that look like anthers, what I just showed you, what's going on in the lab? Does that look like corn pollen? Does that look like corn silks? That's the natural process, not what I just showed you. Transferring the DNA, shooting it with a gene gun into cells, growing it in a little plate in the laboratory. That's not a natural process. The reason why it's not the natural process, because when you're natural, you're moving 20,000 genes, 10 chromosomes. And that's what the human population has been doing with corn for 10,000 years, not using a gene gun. One of the spin-offs, as I said, is patent. Why not? It's through American Ingenuity Research and Development. There are three companies that own about 80% of the plant patents. One of the manifestations of that is economic, of course, surprising. Yeah. Seed costs to our farmers. Uh, compare the consumer price index for that period of time for everything is about 45%, but the consumer price index for corn seed is 259%, not 45. So a bag of seed back in 1995 may have cost $25. And if it's not GMO, in 2011, it was about 36 bucks. But if it's genetically engineered, it's gone from 25 to 87 bucks. And is that corn for feed? That's corn the farmer will buy to plant. For feed? Um, for or any versus, kind of use. Okay, I'm just curious. And the same thing has happened to soybean, to cotton. And on top of that are the royalty fees because these are patented materials. It's R&D, the company has an investment of $40 million, $60 million, $80 million in developing seed. They want their money back with a little profit. So uh, a few years ago, uh, that profit was 8.7 bid, I'm sorry, not the profit, maybe your pardon. The revenue, total revenue was $8.7 billion on something that may have cost 40, 60, $80 million to that's a good return. That's $8,700 million. That's a lot of it. That'll stand you on your head. Legal patents. Let's take a look at this issue. Uh, first, they're good for 20 years. There have been numerous patent infringement cases brought against farmers. For what reason you're wondering? Uh, let's take a look here on the right side as it lights up. Because the patent agreement says there shall be no innocent infringements. So if you, if your farm is downwind and a patented pollen cross pollinates your crop and you discover it, somebody discovers it, you don't own it. You can't sell it. But if you try to sell it, you're in trouble because you've infringed upon the seed company patent. There's no such thing as innocent infringements written into the patent. No minimal amount. And the seed company has prevented the rights of any for any scientist from studying any of the properties associated with that seed. That's one of the reasons why the amount of information that we have is limited. Patent infringement scares the heck out of anybody, including scientists. Okay, let's consider yields. I won't bore you with about three or four slides that I usually show at this time, which to me is very transparent. It says, hey, there's no difference in the yield between these genetically engineered crops and the non-genetically engineered. What do you mean, Ray? There's got to be. I hear from Joe Brown down the street. He does great things with that. And he told me about his cousin back in North Dakota. He gets crops like you can't believe. What do you mean there's no difference? I look at the science, I look at the graphs, I look at tables of information, and there's no difference. So last month, a USDA, United States Department of Agriculture press release, which was picked up, and I've read all 34 pages, and it's complex. The wording is very confusing and careful. The United States Department of Agriculture basically said, hey, there really isn't a difference in yield. Sometimes it's a little lower, even which means sometimes it's a little higher. But overall, there's no mathematical difference. 
Monsanto chief officer was asked, well, how can that be? And his answer, and I'll paraphrase it, was more or less, the American farmer is very intelligent. There must be some reason out there that's giving him an advantage. More or less paraphrasing the response. You hear we're using less pesticide. Okay, I don't know how many of you are used to looking at graphs, but I'll walk you through it. This is the amount of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. You could just say Roundup, you no know, one says glyphosate. Used on corn, soy, and cotton. This is the amount applied in tons in the United States only over time. And you can see when GMOs were introduced in 1996, it started to go up, 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 is the blue line. The blue line is the amount of glyphosate, and it went from about seven to 8,000 tons to 90,000 tons. Depending on how you carve the turkey, you see that's a tenfold increase, it's a thousand percent increase. Either way, it's a lot of increase. Increase in use. Increase in use of glyphosate in the United States farms every year. Now, is this, you think, directly attributable to GE? Say again? Uh, well, everything increases in use, but how much is this attributable to the GE product? Uh, probably 50, 60% is okay. due to the adoption of genetically engineered Roundup-resistant crops over time. But the use, the seed company, thank you for the question because it reminds me to tell you that the seed company has now made their plants more resistant to glyphosate made them tougher, if you will, allowing farmers to put three times the amount of glyphosate on their crop in one pass. Why would they do something like that? Why would they make the plants resist more glyphosate? Come on, people, so they can sell more, right? And so our farmers can get a little leg up in trying to combat weed resistance on American farms. Oh, by the way, the red line here that was increasing, that's the incidence of serious weed resistance to glyphosate in the United States. It infests about 62 million acres, more or less a third of the Midwest cropland at this time. What are the consequences of that? Well, I'm gonna go skip a little bit ahead and tell you what it looks like, then we'll, we'll talk about the, the consequences of weed resistance. Okay, here's a soybean crop, young plants, and they've been sprayed with Roundup, soybeans. Here, the weed has died, but here, the weed has not died. It's looking green. And on a worst case basis, a month and a half later, that's what it could look at, like. That's an American crop field in, yeah, in Illinois. No harvest of any soybeans off of that day. Where did they go? They just were completely overwhelmed by weeds that cannot be controlled with the use of Roundup. Why? Because the weeds are resistant. How did they get resistant? They were always there. But spray, 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 spray every year, eventually the few unusual natural mutations that are scattered throughout the field become the dominant crop. It's called natural selection. And it's not in one place, it's throughout the United States where these kinds of crops are grown, and in fact it's throughout the world. Roundup resistant crops, I like to say, have left a nasty footprint. In every country they have been grown in, there is a problem emerging, different levels, different amounts, of weed resistance to Roundup. And it's slowly creeping, 2002 versus 2012, started in uh, central corn belt, it's now cotton belt, corn belt, soybean, uh, it's canola in Canada, and in Oregon it's ryegrass. Was one the highest or eight? I'm sorry. 
Sorry? And that graph was one the highest or eight? I'm sorry, uh, eight Sorry. is the highest. Okay. Is, that's so the number of different weed species, species okay. that have grown to be resistant. Okay. okay. It's, right. it's a terrible problem. And, yes. What did you say the weed was in Oregon? That's the problem? Uh, ryegrass in Deschutes County and Malheur County. So we'll talk about that in a second. Low on that. Pardon me? We're pretty low on the scale of the mutation and stuff that happens. Uh, uh, we are. Yes, yes, for now, yeah. So I likened this problem of weed resistance to antibiotic resistance. You have an earache, you go to the doctor, you ask for an antibiotic. Three days you're back, doc, I still have my antibiotic, give me another one. The farmer still has a weed resistant problem. What is he, he's gonna look for another herbicide, but his crop's only resistant to glyphosate. He can't spray 2,4-D. He can't spray isoxafutol. He's going to have to hire people to get out there and pull those weeds by hand if he wants to harvest a decent crop. But, oh, Doc, I still have that antibiotic-resistant thing going on. Give me another antibiotic. And the farmer might say that to his chemical supplier. And the doc might say, I'm sorry, this one's going to cost you a little more money. And the side effects, geez, it's going to give you diarrhea and you're going to have to take a week off from work. And the chemical supplier might say to the farmer, oh, and this is fact, it's going to cost you three times the amount to use this chemical. And you're going to have to hire somebody to apply it because it's a restricted use pesticide. It's bad stuff. It's got side effects. And you don't want it blowing on the vineyard downwind. So you got to hire someone. I'm not, these are facts, folks. I read these in published peer-reviewed journal articles in the newspapers coming out of the Midwest, listening to agronomists in American universities talk about this. Weed resistance in agriculture is a serious problem. Where is this going? We need new antibiotics, or we need crops that can withstand new chemicals. We do. That's where we're headed. Oh, those chemicals, they're widely available. Uh, the Chinese equivalent to Amazon is Alibaba. Go check it out. Do a Google search tonight. You'll see that any kind of chemical you ever heard of for your crops are available, including carcinogens like isoxafutol. Oh, they're not highly pure, they're only 98%, so that means 2%, you don't even know what you're doing. <coughs> Another problem, along with the weed resistance, is the resistance of the insects. So the BT toxin that we talked about right at the front end is this wonderful bacterial toxin that's been available to sustainable organic farming operations for almost 100 years. It's a good thing, in my estimation. But it's been presented to the environment in every single corn cell, every single plant, soybean, cotton, etc., for the last 17 years. And through natural selection, we're now seeing resistant insects insects that can chew your corn down and not die even though they're full of the toxin. And here's some examples just published in March of this year, field evolved resistance to the corn root worm in Midwestern United States. Here's a critter, the larvae, right on the root of a corn plant, chomping away. This is a happy, healthy corn root. This is one that's been chewed upon. Because the, this, these insects here were resistant. What does it look like in the field? This is what it can look like with the roots pretty much gone, a little wind comes along, the plants go down. When your plants go down, you're not going to get them up easily into a combine to harvest your corn. Even though you may see the cobs, how, how, how cruel is that? You see the cobs maturing on your plants that are on the ground and you can't get them picked up for harvest. Not a good deal. So that's a problem. What are we doing about these things? Oh, here's over time. The red bars is the number of confirmed insect species 
pests that are resistant to Bt toxin. Got one to two to three to four to five species as the amount of Bt toxin plants increased over time. Well, the solution to that problem is to go for another pesticide, specifically insecticide, because you're trying to get rid of the insects, right? And companies have gone to something called neonicotinoids, very widely used, very widely available insecticide. You can buy it by the ton at home depot for your garden use. Well, that creates another problem, and it's called honeybee colony collapse. 37 million dead bees, that's the new problem that is trying to solve the old problem of the corn root worm. Let's get rid of that by soaking the seeds in the neonicotinoid, charging our farmers a little bit more money. He plants the seeds, and that chemical neonicotinoid is called a systemic insecticide, and it goes throughout the plant, and it goes to the pollen. Bees pollinate corn? Are you kidding me? Come on, who knows about that? Well, I knew you were going to be skeptical. That's why I grabbed this picture. About 90% of the 90 million acres of corn in the United States are pollinated by bees. I didn't know that. I hope you all know that. And there's trace, trace amounts. It's called parts per billion of the neonicotinoid in the pollen. The honeybees are so sensitive to that. From laboratory experiments, there's just enough in that corn pollen to seriously lower the immune system of the bees. And when any kind of a agent comes along, a pathogen for the bee, no immune system, bang, they fall. Whether it be a mite or a fungus or a germ. That's how we're getting rid of the bees in the world. And in Europe, they canceled the use of the nicotinoids. EPA says, go for it, baby. When did Europe we're do that? Going. When, when, when did Europe do that? Uh, very recently, in 2013. Yeah. While the issue is studied further. Yeah. Another problem is the spread of seeds. And I think we've heard about this. Uh, this is how the seeds can be spread. Wind gusts, seeds, not just pollen. Seeds, <coughs> tornadoes, Midwest, carry seeds 60 miles, migrating birds, and farm equipment, etc. Ships and ports. I love this photograph. Uh, I'm sorry, painting entitled Migrating Maze. Coming down from Canada, filling up on corn in the Midwest, and releasing corn as they fly down to Mexico. If it's transgenic corn, how about that for innocent infringement? Uh, in Switzerland, where uh, seeds, can, genetically engineered seeds cannot be developed, cannot be planted, crops cannot be grown, we have some, seen some seeds spill out of bags at the port. Notice all the dead grass and weeds here. And notice there are a few green patches that have survived the spraying with Roundup. And we have volunteers out picking up those uh, canola, resist, Roundup resistant canola. Same thing in Japan. Volunteers out to clean it up. Uh, Canada has had a history of exporting flaxseed to Western Europe for many years. That industry was knocked down dead temporarily uh, uh, about, what, 2010, till they got things straightened out. They had uh, some contamination in their flaxseed, Roundup resistant flaxseed. Uh, news in four years ago in the Manitoba area, CNBC News, Canadian flaxseed's been shut out of the, their largest market because of trace amounts of genetically engineered something called trippet. I don't know that seed, but it's related to flax. Is that because they're concerned with the, the, the legal issue? That's one of them. Thank you for asking that great question. Why is this of contamination scared the hell out of everybody? It seems like this whole thing's evolving around reasons. the legal issue of this contamination, yes. cross contamination. Or can you send your wheat someplace yes. that could potentially? There are multiple issues. One is legal. No innocent infringement in the patent. 
if somebody wanted to get tough with you, that's allowed. And in January, three months ago, the Supreme Court of the United States verified that. In addition, there are cultural reasons. There are people in Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, and in Western Europe that just don't want to have anything to do with consuming genetically engineered food. That's why there are 64 nations in the world that require labeling. Not us, of course, but there are 64 out there. And you know, you've heard of them, like people who can't afford to have their foods labeled, like us. Well, let's see, Peru is on the list, South Vietnam is on the list requiring labels, uh, China, Russia. So if you want your, G your food labeled as containing GMO, even though it's come from Iowa, go to Russia, you'll see a label. <laughs> Okay, so it's a cultural thing, it's a legal thing, and let's not leave out, it's a seed buyer thing, the third party. So if a lease has a seed crop raised organically and she gets a buyer in who has customers in France, and he's going to ask her, are you GMO free? Have you had it tested? Uh, you need to test it. And she doesn't always know because what we got now is secret location. And if pollen can travel four years, four miles on sugar beets, on the worst case scenario, maybe only two miles, but she can't see out two miles or four miles what her neighbors out there are growing. So right now she would have to incur the expense, $200. But what if it tests positive? Then she loses that seed buyer. That's bringing it home to Jackson County. That's what really bothers me in this whole deal. This is my point that I really want to pound home tonight. There are problems in the Midwest ecological. Do we want those problems that I've shared with you so far? Do we want them here? They're going to come. This is a wonderful place to grow crops. Jackson County, Willamette Valley. Right now, those problems, so far as we know, are not here. The problems that are here are the seed contamination, the pollen cross contamination, the loss of income from family farms. That's what this thing is all about, the vote next one. Okay, I'm going to tell you quickly, uh, here's a farmer in Spain. It's not just an Oregon problem. Uh, after 10 years of disputed results, finally American scientists have confirmed that there have been crosses of Monsanto BT corn with traditional heritage varieties of Mexican corn. And uh, finally, uh, last year, the Supreme Court of Mexico banned, effective immediately, the Monsanto GMO corn. And notice this little symbol that they've got, see maiz, no hay maiz. In other words, without corn, we're nothing in this country of Mexico. That's how they feel about it. Problems with Chinese turning down importation of American corn because of a variety that wasn't approved in China. Call it a trade embargo. It doesn't matter what you call it. The bottom line is turned away from the port. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. China's been growing their own genetic Different variety. Different genetic makeup. Not approved in China. And but we yeah. know that. We, of course, know that. We have trained these people. We know what's going on in China and Russia, et cetera, et cetera. We know better. And in my personal opinion, not read this, we're just trying to sneak that one under the carpet. And we got caught. Syngenta got caught. We all know, remember what happened uh, last summer with the scare in uh, uh, Eastern uh, uh, Oregon wheat ranch? Bless his heart. Can you imagine the courage of this fella making all of this public at the expense of losing over 300,000 bucks of his crop? 
hey, I have a problem here, I need help, I don't know where these genetically engineered roundup resistant wheat plants came from. My God, my hat's off to that guy. But while three to four months went by to straighten out the problem and reassure our Asian customers that we could get our act together, there was no more contamination. There's some wheat in this county that got rained on, not harvested, and one of your fellow farmers lost a quarter of a million dollars. Not fun. Not fun. Cross-pollination happens both ways, right? You've got GMO pollen going and adulterating a non-genetically engineered crop and the other way too, right? But only going in one direction are you working with infringement and patents and a detection system. If your non-GMO pollen goes across the street and cross-pollinates a genetically engineered crop, no one is ever going to be able to detect. There's no seed buyer that's going to walk away. There's no legal consequences. There's no economic consequences. So it's a one-way street. And who suffers is the non-GMO farmer. So when a certain lobbyist in Jackson County gets on the radio and tells you it's corruption, as he did me, it's corruption when you have a non-genetically engineered pollen going across the street and affecting Syngenta's crop. It's corruption baloney. Why is it corruption? Nobody knows it happened. Nobody cares. Nobody's paying any legal fees, etc. It's not corruption. It's corruption the other direction. Ray, I'm just going Ray. to try to round this, wrap this up. Yes. Why aren't GMO farmers concerned about cross pollination? Isn't, isn't the value of their product going to go down if they sell them as round and ready and they're not? I don't think that. They're not concerned because it's not a problem uh, and it's all about genetics and it's all about technology. Let me go through that again because that's a very important question. Let's say, let's talk about corn, and let's say over here it's genetically engineered and across the street at the other farmers, he's uh, sustainable, he or she is a sustainable farmer. So we have cross-pollination. The seed buyer can't detect that. <coughs> if that seed, those kernels happen to go out for replanting, Again, for the next crop, you know you're not allowed to do that because you signed a contract. You can't, you don't own that seed. It doesn't matter if it's cross-pollination because you can't replant that seed next season. You're not going to know if there's been any adulteration. And furthermore, even more strongly, the presence of the bacterial genes offer dominant expression of the gene. So even if you get cross-pollination from a non-genetically engineered crop, the progeny will still have the same phenotype, will still express resistance to Roundup, and will still produce the Bt toxin. Those are some of the reasons why it just doesn't matter the one direction. It's only coming back when you are on the receiving end of the genetically engineered crop that things are detectable, seed buyers walk away, there are cultures on the planet that don't want to have anything to do with a mixed crop. Okay, I've shown, I'm going to really go fast to wrap up and give the floor to Elise. Uh, this is a plot showing 13 mile uh, transmission of genetically engineered grass seed, of uh, uh, grass pollen in Deschutes County from a test that was done in 2003. The company was fined, Scott Seed was fined a half a million dollars because it came from an experimental plot and moved 13 miles off the plot, a big no-no. 
Uh, after that, more genetically resistant, genetically engineered, Roundup resistant grass was found near Ontario, Oregon. And they knew through tests that it came from a test site in Idaho, Pharma, Parma, sorry, site of the thin grass field. <laughs> and it traveled, I don't know, it's about 10 miles. And it's found growing in the irrigation canals, up the sides of the irrigation canals, and out onto the farmland. It's Roundup resistant grass. And it's been there for about five years before it was detected. So it's had time to multiply, multiply. That's why Oregon is on the national map of Roundup resistant grass from these two mistakes. So guess what happens with stock grass? They're back. They're just announced that they're going to sell you the, for your backyard some Kentucky bluegrass that they have made Roundup resistant. And they've done it in such a way that fits right through the regulatory loopholes at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Oh, so they're back. Can we buy that grass? You can buy that grass. But I think, I don't know out in the West yet. I know they've given seeds to their employees to plant the grass. No, the what I'm saying is if, if this major pass is Oh. Can we buy this new genetically for our backyard? No. Okay. Do you want to sign a legal contract? No. Uh, just, I mean, do you I'm, want to? So this is going to go, this will extend, I'm not saying anything yeah. wrong. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So this could extend into, there's going to be grass seed that we can't buy for our backyard and things like that for just somebody who lives in town? Can, can you buy it now? No. Cannot buy it now. Not yet. Not here, not in order to But this is not a crop. The bluegrass is not a crop. I'm taking a measure of one of the crops. I don't know what the word is, if it's crop or if it's plant. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But when it does come to Oregon, if you have an organic dairy, and you're producing organic milk for organic cheese, certified cheese, you're in trouble because that seed's going to blow five miles down, downwind. And it could come from your backyard. Is that something you want? Not me. Uh, if you raise grass-fed beef in an organic operation, you get Roundup-resistant grass growing in your pastures, pastures, you're no longer, you no longer have an organic uh, beef operation. Is that something that you want to happen because somebody who lives in the city of Medford has this stuff growing in their backyard? Not me. Even if it's not organic, what are the health effects of drinking milk or eating cheese of a cow that's been eating contaminated? Well, thanks to the legal requirements on the patent, American scientists have not, probably will not, and are not going to, period, look into those answers. There are beginnings of information coming out of Europe from their scientists, and it doesn't look great, doesn't look good. Everybody in the scientific arena is waiting for more information, more data. Yeah. I think you should point out, though, that uh, grass is probably the worst weed you can have in a garden. So if you have a garden, yeah. a roundup bit of grass mm -hmm. growing in the, in the cracks in the sidewalk and spreading all over the place, it's not a good thing. Uh, a farm yeah, you, you, know, you understand one of the manifestations from having this in your lawn. If, it, if a seed blows into your neighbor's yard, you're in trouble, uh, number one. And I think he was saying, you, you know, we all have weeds in our, on our property. You want Roundup resistant weeds now that you have to spray, say, with 2,4-D or uh, a probable human carcinogen that's coming on the market. You know, you gotta 
go the full 306 degrees and think through all the consequences of this. You want to be the first person on your block to have Roundup resistant genetically engineered grass in your lawn, you better have deep pockets because somebody's going to sue you. I predict that. Somebody will sue you for a patent. I, I, don't, I don't want that stuff growing in my yard. And I'm trying to control my weeds over here and I, yeah, I use rabbit. But I've got something here I can't kill. What am I going to do this? So you're saying, excuse me, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're saying no matter the heck you are, I'm, I'm potentially liable to be sued for using one of these products or the product blows in from some place? Absolutely. Is that what you're telling me? <coughs> that's the whole thing. That's what I've been saying all along. In my backyard, that's what you're saying. Somebody's going to sue. There is no innocent infringement. Mm -hmm. You might want to elaborate that innocent infringement a little bit more. I mean, it makes sense to me, but give uh, some examples. It's like an innocent bystander. Hey, I didn't have anything to do with this. Uh, it just happened by Mother Nature. Oh, you planted something in your yard that you let pollinate? And it cross-pollinated. I don't want. I don't want your gene stuff in my backyard. Kind of a thing. So this is to yeah. interfere with some people's property rights. Could it? Uh, I don't. I'm not an attorney. I don't. I don't know. If that's the right phraseology. Maybe it is. I. I don't know. It is a property rights issue as a farmer because that pollen blows onto my field if I'm growing something. Going back to the sugar beet issue, which is very real in Jackson County, <coughs> if we're growing. The deal is, is some things can get contaminated by that pollen that aren't necessarily a sugar beet crop. If I'm growing chard, we grow a lot of chard, sold out today in Medford at the farmer's market. If I like that variety and I want to keep it and grow it for seed, and somebody's growing sugar beets, yeah. GMO sugar beets out in my valley, it can ruin my chard crop. That's property infringement for me. This whole issue for our county is property infringement. I, I understand what you're saying, uh, and Elise may, may have a, a different comment than I, but that's already been tested, uh, and it went to the Supreme Court in January, and they gave Monsanto the win. You have infringed. You have infringed as an innocent bystander. You have taken my genetically engineered patented pollen and then seeds, and you're going to try to sell it. I'm going to come get you. That's the problem that we have right now. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, over a half a million years, I'm not quite sure how we managed to get here and we're all alive and we're conscious and we're sucking air without congenital. Because we obviously can't live without him now because what's happening? He's well, stepping in between two farmers, and he's making us enemies, and he's making us doubt one another, and he's making us uh, fragmented and unsure of who we are and where we came from, and if we're even going to exist anymore because we've got to have Syngenta, and I'm rather confused. Let, let me just make one last comment on one last slide, and I want to give the floor to uh, Elise, who can answer some of these other issues a lot, heck of a lot better than I. I, I. I don't feel real comfortable stepping out of being a scientist and talking about the science part, you know, like when it comes to backyard lawsuits. That, that's not my area of specialty. It bothers me, it worries me, but that's not my specialty. But I'll, I'll just finish up making sure that you all know I mean, we all have different feelings about the United Nations, but I do want to tell you that that organization has designated this year internationally 
as the year of the family farmer and is encouraging family farmers throughout the world to think more along the lines of regenerative types of farming. Not the spray, 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 not the genetically engineered, but ways to uh, farm organically, sustainably, regeneratively, biologically, these are all the terms that are coming. Traditionally, of course, using non-GMOs, and you're thinking, that ain't gonna work. And I know why you're thinking that, because I used to think the same way. How are we going to get a farmer who's got an acre and a half times a million others to feed the world? Here's the guy you all need to meet on the internet. His name is David Brandt. And I really am so intrigued with this fellow. He's an Ohio farmer, Ohio Agricultural Farmer of the Year in 2011. And he practices regenerative farming. He sees that every year he has a winter cover crop saves his soil, it mines the soil, it puts nitrogen back into the soil, turns that crop under and grows conventionally the next year without GMO, uses less pesticide, uses less fertilizer, and more than makes up the cost for the cost of the cover crop and running a plow across that land. Google him and learn what he does. <coughs> Brilliant. Oh, and he farms 1,200 acres. So I'm going to finish there, turn it over to Elise, and then when she's done, let's hear some more questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to hear some more on the, the health and the water side as a scientist. Um, the effects on children and things like that later. So, um, so I um, I have a local farm. My husband and I run a farm um, in the Applegate. We're on 116 acres, and we grow uh, vegetables and herbs. And um, you know, for the last couple of years, I've watched and participated a little bit back and forth, volunteering with GMO, GMO Free Jackson County, and was really just. Um, you know, so grateful for this group of people to get this on this ballot and to allow us um, this opportunity to vote on this important uh, measure. And um, in January, like Christina explained, um, uh, GMO for Jackson County and together gathered a bunch of farmers and, you know, we talked about the reality, this economic effect that it has on all of us and that we really need to get our heads and hands out of the soil for a bit and look, and it was good timing because it was January, so we had a little extra free time. <laughs> And um, said, you know, if we don't step up and let the community know how much this affects us as family farmers, that we might really regret not spending our time and energy doing that this season. So, um, you know, I'm not working on the farm right now. I'm full-time working on this campaign. And um, it's really been, you know, eye-opening. It's definitely been a great opportunity to meet so many other people in the community. And I'm really proud to say that I, I think that we have a real chance of winning this measure. Um, even with the news coming in today that um, Monsanto, Syngenta, and Dow just uh, donated another $480,000 into the campaign, making it a total of $800-something thousand dollars that they're find, fighting our little county um, measure for. So, and I think, you know, for me it just, it just reaffirms that um, this cause is so important. There's a reason why they're dumping all this money in here is because we have a real jewel of a place, and we all know that, that live here. This money is 98% coming from out of county. And, um, you know, they want to kind of tell us what to do on our land. And I think that we are strong enough and educated enough and can ask the questions we need um, and get the, the answers we need to really vote yes on this measure to protect the family farms and to protect the home gardeners and protect the food in our valley. And, you know, Ray gives that example, that slide, that farmer. I mean, all, we are so fortunate that we have so many people growing food in this valley. We can sustain ourselves on the food that we grow in this valley. Um, it's not a, a matter of not growing enough food. It's about distribution. And it's about giving farmers no more obstacles than they already need to have. Anyone knows that they don't get into farming because it's easy. They believe in, you know, providing a good thing for the world and for their local economy. And we certainly can do it, but we don't need to be um, threatened with lawsuits, and we don't need our market to be shut down. Um, I think, like Ray mentioned earlier, 
that there is a real loss in our county already. This is a great seed growing area because we have all these little isolated pockets. Hopefully you've got a chance to look at the map out there and it shows that you know we have all these little isolated pockets in the valley. So it just is a prime area to grow seeds. And the seed industry is a huge industry. I mean, there's a lot, there's hundreds and thousands of dollars people are making on seed, just our little farmers. And so, you know, primarily what's happening and why this measure came about it's um, because we realized that Syngenta, a Swiss-owned company who's not allowed to grow their seed in their country, um, has come into the Rogue Valley and started these little test plots and growing plots for their sugar beet seed. And so they've gotten these little, you know, four, uh, quarter acre plots all around. And you can see on the map that the contamination um, distance, I think Christina is going to be Van White and bring in the, the map. <laughs> so um, what happens is, so we are all at risk of being contaminated for, on our farms, whether it's corn, whether it's in the, the beet family. So it's like everything, you know, all of our obstacles come across. We've got the same thing with wheat. Um, for instance, even I have a conventional uh, corn grower next to me who grows sweet corn. He's been growing for three generations, and he, you know, boasts that his sweet corn is the best around. And um, he is, you know, not into organic, but he saves his seed every year, and he knows. Like he said, I, I really want to support this measure passing because um, if I don't, then I won't be able to save my seed anymore. And that take puts him out of business. Um, see, growing or buying seed is a huge cost for a farm, especially a farm that you know is on a larger scale. I mean, if we're on, I would say, somewhat smaller scale, we spend like seven to ten thousand dollars on seed this year. On and so whatever seed we can save, that just you know it is more money that we can make. You know, it's the seed. You look at a box of seed like this. I mean, this could be you know twenty thousand dollars worth of seed right here. So it's, it's a viable industry and we need to protect it in our area. And seed is becoming harder and harder to come by. Any farmer can tell you to get um, clean seed, you're having to go sometimes out of this nation. You're going, you're going out into Europe to find the seed that you need. It's getting more and more expensive. So I feel really adamant about preserving the right to save our seed. And then the other part is just the you know, contamination, the, the risk of being at, um, in lawsuits. And you'll hear from the opponents, but, well, there's only been you know a few hundred lawsuits in the in the last decade from Monsanto and some of these big companies, but they don't tell you about the thousands and thousands and thousands of um, settlements because you know if I'm going to come and get a knock on my door from Syngenta, I can guarantee you that I don't have the money to take them to court, especially knowing that they're just raised eight hundred thousand dollars for this uh, battle here. Um, so I'm going to end up settling, and I'll probably lose my farm, and that's what hap has happened. I think the Food Safety Council reported just under 5,000 uh, settlements um, in the U.S. alone of small farmers. So it is something that's really happening. It's not something where we're being paranoid that, you know, we're going to get in trouble. And it really makes our market unsellable. You've looked at other counties, um, the three other counties. Hopefully you all take one of these um, political bull flyers that kind of uh, talks about some of the other sides, um, you know, what they're calling facts about cost. Um, but we look at other counties and we thought, okay, let's look at the three counties that have the measure it, almost exactly like ours. All of them have said there's been no cost at all. This is counties that have like double our agricultural sales. So uh, the no cost at all. Some of them say, well, maybe we get a phone call once a year, um, but it's, you know, hasn't really brought us off of our desk or out of our desk to do anything about it. And you think, okay, well, why is like, why is the compliance so great? The compliance is so great is because you can't just like go down to your store and buy, gen buy genetically engin engineered seeds and grow a patentable crop. You have to register with the chemical company. You have to get a bunch of paperwork. You have to sign legal documents, and then you grow it. And you're not allowed, like Ray said, you're not allowed to buy to save your seed anymore. And you've also given away your rights um, that those that company can come onto your property at any time and inspect your property. So. What, what company is, you know, especially a multinational company that has a lot at risk, who would come in and have somebody, first of all, you have to have a homeowner or a landowner that's going to be say, hey, can you come and can I sign these documents when it's illegal in my county to sign them? And then you've got to get a company dumb enough to say, yeah, we're going to bring in some legal documents for you to sign that's in, illegal in your county. Do any of you think that someone's going to sign, two people are going to consent on signing legal documents when it's illegal? So I'm, I think that's why the compliance is so great, because it just doesn't happen. So that, for me, is just reality on that end. 
Um, what I'm just really looking for in talking tonight is just getting people like off of their seats, getting educated, answering questions that you might have, like questions that you're trying to figure out, like the enforcement side. Um, I don't, I'm not a politician, and I don't really know how to you know, present things in a way that is the cleanest. I'm not a scientist, but I am a business owner and a farmer, and I know that this puts us at real risk of losing our farm. And I know that um, we have a brighter future here in Jackson County with this measure passing. Um, it brings up our agricultural sales. Like Ray mentioned, Marin is 10 times the sales that they were with this past 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Um, I see, you know, the wine, the wine trails and all the tourists coming in. I don't think they're coming in to see GE crops. You know, they're coming in because this is a beautiful place to live and to uh, tour little farms. And we really need your help to stand up and know that these big chemical companies are coming in and trying to buy your vote. And so when you hear their ads over and over and everyone calls me like, why don't you get more ads out? I'm like, you know, we, we're, com we're like competing with so much money. So we really need your help. The only way we can do that is by sharing it with your neighbors and with your friends and maybe not your friends and just really talking about it and being able to be knowledgeable enough to say, actually, that's not really what it is. You know, the opponents have given, they had a poll done a while ago and they heard all the things that you care about and they realized that most people who want this measure to pass also care about libraries, they care about the sheriffs, and they care about schools, and they care about cost. So they pour out that all in one and threw it to you and so you got the message of this is going to cost a lot of money and it's going to take away from your schools, your libraries, and your sheriff's department. And so they got a bunch of people scared and that's the only way they're going to win this is by you buying into that message. So um, I'm really confident that all of you are smart enough to see past the money and follow the money. I think it's really important to look at this chart too. Um, the, red, the red circles are all chemical companies that happen to own seed companies. And so, you know, like we talked about, there's such a vested interest in, this, uh, in these seeds being sold because they're selling the chemicals that they're making these seeds resistant to. So it's just a really mixed up industry. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to answer um, hopefully any questions that you might have on um, how this would be implemented and I'm still really learning that as it goes along but I'll, I'll try my best. Yeah. Isn't it true that in the process of getting these um, seeds with the GMO that gives them the ability to patent so their ultimate goal is to have a patent on every seed available to mankind so that we can't even get something without paying the price they want to um, I would, I would tend to agree with you. Um, I don't know if I could say that as a fact, you know, but I definitely think it's pretty mysterious that these chemical, chemical companies own so much seed and the fact that they, um, once you buy their seed, you're not allowed to save it or um, grow it anymore. You have to rebuy it every year. They're about 70% of the way there to own all of the seed companies in the world. And another manifestation of that is, and I, I thank people like yourself that have talked to me about it, is the issue of food security. When you have all the seeds that there are, basically, in the world, being owned by four companies, maybe five at the most. And they're all patented. And interesting. And in, sorry, interesting enough, these um, today the four hundred and eighty thousand dollars that just came in this last month, because this is the day we have to show what you just got in the month before. It was Monsanto, Bayer, Dow, Dupont, and Syngenta that just put that money into this campaign. And I'm sorry, but you know what? I really don't think that Bayer cares about our libraries. Like I really, I, I think that that's such a big crock <laughs> to think that they're trying to you know sell you in the. Um, and I like what Ray talked about too. And we want to talk like, how will this not affect our libraries? You wanted to talk a little bit. Oh, you can sit. Just yeah. stand there. Oh, um, yeah. This this guy's been. Uh, oh, sorry. Can you can you can you just say this one thing about the libraries? Do you mind? Do you mind if he says the one thing about the library thing? Right. Okay. Um, saw an ad yesterday, a uh, Monsanto ad, and as Elise just said a moment ago. So if you vote for 15-119, they're going to take the money away from the libraries, uh, from the sheriff, and I wasn't sure whether the third one was schools or extension, but it says schools, but take, they're take it away. And uh, so I called uh, and spoke to a, a budget person more knowledgeable than I, in fact, today, to talk to him. And uh, he said, okay, think about this scenario. Uh, if 15-119 passes, 
and the library vote does not pass. He says that the only place the library has to get their money is out of the general fund. And there would be this 0.7 of 1% dock from the library budget. And I said, well, wait a minute. I thought that there was a levy for the libraries and that if the levy doesn't pass, all the libraries would close. So there's nothing left to take away from the library because there's no library. Oh, yeah, <laughs> was the answer. <laughs> I'm not joking. Wow. You, you had a question. Uh, you know who Norm uh, Bolar is or was? No. Okay, he was the grandfather of the Green Revolution. Won the Nobel Prize for it. A few months ago, his granddaughter, Julie, gave a speech at an ag expo. And she acknowledged, you know, this whole controversy about GMOs. But she feels that it's necessary to have these tests. I mean, GMOs are going to help us confront the problem of world hunger. Yeah. I wonder what her grandpa would say. Well, no. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay, first. Morlock's claim to fame was all through conventional cross-hybridization and not to take anything away from him. No, 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 no. My hat's off. All he did was to make the wheat seed larger. So that on one acre, instead you get, I don't know what the numbers are, one ton of wheat, you get two and a half. Cross, natural crossbreeding. Nothing wrong with that. Great man, great scientist. Uh, with regards to needing genetically engineered crops to feed the world, please, I know you haven't assimilated yet what I said. There is no difference in the yield of the crops. Genetically engineered versus non-genetically engineered. So if we have to give up genetically engineered crops, we just grow conventional farming. And in the United States and other developed nations, about one third of our food winds up in the landfills. And then I would say further, one of the problem is not getting the food to where it needs because haven't you ever seen news takes on, on when there's a, a problem in a, in, a, in a bad part of the world? Somebody's always carrying that bag of corn and it says product of the USA on it. I love to see that. But the problem with a lot of those bags don't get beyond the rebels or the troops in the country that's having a problem. It doesn't get to the hungry feed, the, the hungry to feed them. So it's called a distribution problem. That's the kind language for it. So I'm not worried if we no longer in this nation, not just Jackson County, no longer grow genetically engineered crops. There are going to be other differences, other problems with the switchover. It ain't going to happen overnight. It's going to be take, probably take 10, 12 years for the seed adjustment. But it isn't going to starve the millions of the world. We do that. It's not a logical argument based on what we know. Two, two, two quick questions. Um, um, an, an individual, you know, I'm anti-genetic engineer, but um, and it, people who may say, well, what's the difference of eating one or the other, and, aside from the legal problems and all that? You know, what's the big difference? And the second part of that question is when you said 70% of this is, let's say, global, is an issue, is there a fix? Is there, is there, is a, there a fix? No, right. Um, yeah, I can think of a couple of answers to that. That's a really good question and original one. It's getting me to, to think about it. You know, one, <laughs> let's look after the 30% that have not yet sold out. One. 
and let's develop some regions in the United States, why not Oregon, that are seed sanctuaries, where people come here from all over the world. Folks, we, I've lived in Oregon for over 40 years, and I don't know if I've ever appreciated more than I do right now in knowing how unique the climate, the soil, and our irrigation water supply availability is in the Willamette Valley and in the Rogue Valley. People come here from around the world to buy seeds. Why not grow more of that? Why not grow the pure, genetically engineered, heritage, heirloom type seeds? And to, I, I, I just intuitively feel if we got on that kick, wow, agriculture in Western Oregon, not just here, Western Oregon would explode. We have one heck of a specialty seed market that generates about $50 million a year in the Willamette Valley that's trying right now to be protected from genetically engineered canola. And they do, they do have protection. A temporary. Mm -hmm. Okay, young lady in the back. Oh, Thank you. Population. Think about that, study that, it's you. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that comes to, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not saying go back to the agriculture of the 50s and 60s where it was spray, 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 baby. Remember, I, I'm in love with regenerative forms of agriculture. You got to spray, you know, okay, but yeah, get it done and don't do it regularly. Don't rely so much on uh, petroleum-based products to grow our foods. You know, there's a lot of carcinogens separate from the chemicals per se that go into our foods. Yeah. What are, they're petroleum-based compounds. Oh, right here. The do you believe that every biotech company is out to is out on some the nefarious scheme. You're asking me? Yeah, well. Uh, do you feel that if, no. If, no. Okay, so you feel that there are some biotech companies? I, I don't know. All I know is that me as a farmer, I'm being hurt economically by having people grow genetically engineered crops nearby my farm. And that I feel that I'm at risk. I know that I'm at risk because I've seen, you know, thousands and thousands of farms be put out of business. And I know that my, my marketability of my product it gets taken away. I know I have friends and fa like farmers that have lost their seed contract, that have not been able to save their seed anymore because they've been contaminated by the genetically engineered crops. I know lots and lots of farmers all in the Rogue Valley. We have our kids go to school here. We eat here, we pay our property tax, we do, we're, we're good citizens, we care about the planet, we grow food for you to eat here, and I know that we're at risk, and I don't think that it's fair for a big multi-million dollar corporation to come in here and take away my rights to farm. Well, and I understand that. But what I'm saying is, do you feel that? Like any, any, any group who's trying to genetically engineer food to help people, is that? So I don't believe that people are growing genetically engineered food to help people. I believe they're growing it to make a sh crap load of money someplace else. Amen. <laughs> so, no, I, no, no, no. So, I'm just trying. No, okay, so. You are generalizing it. I'm telling you that people that are growing, that are selling genetically engineered seed are out to make a bunch of money. Yes. And I'm telling you that the farmers I know that have grown genetically engineered seed and then compared it to conventional farming have got a lot better yield and a lot better money for their, for their crop because they get a better yield and they pay less money for their seed. And do I think that people that are growing genetically engineered crops are bad people? No, I don't. But I think that everybody, I can relate, I, it's happened to me where I've been sold on a product or sold by some, you know, idea that I thought could like, be a super easy fix. We've all made mistakes. 
I don't think that they're bad people. I think that actually the farmers that are not growing genetically engineered food can help these people make more money on their farm and be able to sustain themselves here and to give back to the community instead of taking it away. I, I would like to offer something here. I, I'm not a farmer, but I come from a farm environment, and I, I really appreciate what all you farmers are doing. And it's, it's essential that you be protected. But my, I offer this, you know, if you compare your population to the total population, you, you're, you're the, the minority. You've got to leverage this thing and make the total population understand what the risk is to them. The risk to them, it's been proven in foreign countries, is people that eat animals that consume this stuff are hurt. The animals themselves are hurt. The whole economy breaks down, it hurts. 